Joshua chapter 12, or chapter 12, chapter 13, we're going to look at very briefly. Chapter 14 is where we will spend the majority of our time together. But let's open up to Joshua chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 1 here, and it says, These are the kings of the land whom the children of Israel defeated. So we know what this chapter is about. The chapter is about kings that were de de defeated by the children of Israel. Well, we've been looking at that, right? And we've been, we, we know Joshua went into the land leading the people and there have been kings that have been defeated. So this chapter gives us a list of kings that have been uh, defeated. We are not going to read through that list. Why? Is it not important? Well, it is important, but it really is important from a historical viewpoint or aspect. It's good to know, it's good for them to have a record and a list of, hey, this king was defeated, and this king was defeated, and this king was defeated. For you and I, as we study the Bible in here on Sundays and Wednesdays, what we are looking for is some solid, practical application uh, with, you know, some, some, some points and different things. Um, there is some practical application, and I'll mention that in just a moment, but that's why we're not reading through this list of names, because to read through a list of names might be interesting, from a historical aspect, uh, but not necessarily from a, 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 you know looking for some practical some practical points to take out of it. There is a practical point though. Go down to verse ten of Joshua chapter twelve, and there's a list from verse I'm sorry verse nine down to the bottom, and it looks very very similar. The, only the names have changed. The king of Jericho one, the king of Ai, which is beside Bethel one. It goes on, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, and it mentions all of the kings, and it says one next to it. What it's doing is it's giving us a list and saying, hey, there was this one king, he got defeated. There was this other king, he got defeated. There was this king, he was defeated. And it's just giving us a simple list. However, there is some practical application to be received from it before we move on. And it is this. It is that in life you will face challenges or battles. That's obvious. Some of you have faced some battles already. Family stuff or whatever's gone on. It is important that you and I understand that Joshua was human. He was not supernatural. And for the most part, he faced his battles one at a time. Now, we just finished reading a couple of chapters where there were five kings that gathered and they were all wiped out at once. And there were these other five kings and they got wiped out at once. But generally speaking, these kings and these city-states and the battles were taken one at a time. That is extremely important, not only for your faith, but for your mental health and your mental well-being also. Some of us are like out of sight, out of mind people. Anybody in here like that? Like, if I don't see it, I'm just not going to think about it. Anybody like that? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in there somewhere a little bit. Uh, some of us are thinkers, man. We think about things. Anybody in here like that? You just, you think about things. Some of us, there's a third group, are overthinkers. Anybody in here an overthinker? Yeah. And, and we feel bad for the overthinkers because, man, it is, it's tough because you're thinking, you're thinking and thinking and thinking and overthinking about all sorts of things. And you could have, you know, 10, 20 things going on in your mind. Um, as it relates to battles and challenges. What can happen sometimes for any of us is that we get too focused on regrets from the past. We've all got them. I've got some huge regrets from the past. We can get focused, too focused on those, not let them go. You got to let them go. You got to learn from them and then let them go. Some of us freak out about the future. That's one of the things that we do best. And man, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen in two years? What's going to happen when I graduate? What's going to happen when, you know, in 16 years when I'm married and I have a three-year-old kid or whatever? And some of us just go on and on and wait, like, we're there, man. We're just, we're going crazy about that stuff. Some of us, we go crazy about tomorrow, this week, whatever. It's important to remember that you no longer have the past. It is the past. Now, again, there are valuable lessons to learn there. You take those lessons, you move forward. But you can't move too far forward because you can't step foot into the future. The future's yet to come. The future is tomorrow, and you're not there yet. And so there's only so much time and attention that you want to give to tomorrow, to the future, because you don't have that. And in fact, the Bible says that none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. We may not survive today. 
So you don't want to spend too much time freaking out about the future because you may never see it. Plus, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. God does. we got to just trust the Lord. So that leaves us with only the present. So we no longer have the past. We no longer, or we do not have the future yet, but what we do have is this moment right here, right now. And so it is important that you and I take those battles one at a time. Whatever's there right now, that's what I'll do. Now, it is wise to do some planning for the future, but those plans really have to be kind of loose because I don't really know, God, what's, what's going to happen in the future. So I want to make my plans and then take those plans and submit them to God's uh, approval and say, God, here are my plans. These are pretty good plans. But Lord, I don't know what's coming in the future, and you do, and I want you to change my plans if you need to change my plans, Lord, because I don't, I don't have that yet. And we learn that lesson from Joshua here in this list. We're reminded that, oh, that's right. There were, there were other kings, and most of those battles took place one at a time. Just whatever's in front of you, deal with that. You know, invite the Lord into whatever it is that you have going on right now. Some of you, you know, trying to fight battles on, you know, three, four, multiple fronts. You don't want to do that one at a time, okay? One at a time. Let's move on to Joshua chapter 13. We'll read through a few verses there. It says in verse 1, I love this. Now, Joshua was old, advanced in years. So what did the Lord say to him? You are old, advanced in years. Don't you love that when somebody reminds you that you're getting older? It's like, I already know I'm getting older. They like to tell you, you know, on your birthday, you know, you're turning 15 or 16 or whatever, and they're like, oh, man, you're getting older. It's like, yeah, I already know that. Thanks. The older you get, you know, you become an adult or rather a parent or whatever. It's going to be even more like, yeah, thanks a lot. I already knew I was getting older. I didn't need you to tell me, but thanks a lot for reminding me. Well, this is hilarious. I think that's funny that God tells him, Joshua already knows, but God reminds him, you're old and advanced in years. Here's where, what we want to look at for just a moment. And there remains very much land yet to be possessed. He goes on in verse 2 to say, this is the land that yet remains. So what this chapter ends up being is a list of lands that still need to be conquered. Now, I've mentioned this briefly in the last one or two chapters that we went through together. And I'll, I'll mention it here because... We're like, this is where it's happening. What we're going to see here, and we will see it in verse 7 in just a moment, is that there's still land that needs to be conquered. Joshua didn't take over the entire land yet. He took over the major portions. He did what God had called him to do. But at this point, what happens is now whatever's left of the land, smaller portions, is going to be divided up into or, or for the tribes of Israel. And there were 12 Twelve and a half tribes, but twelve tribes of Israel. And each of these tribes is going to get a portion of land. And so Joshua, you know, he wiped out Jericho, you know, I, uh, the, those five kings that came, another five kings that came, but there are still plenty of other city-states. And Joshua has done his work, what God called him to do, but now it's time for the tribes, the individual tribes, to go into their areas and do what they need to do. That's their responsibility. And so that's what this chapter is all about. So again, we have a list that we do not necessarily need to read through. We're looking for some practical application. But there is some practical application. Look at verse 7. Now therefore, divide this land as an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. So that's what I just told you. The land's being divided. It's a, a lesson there, a simple lesson, and that is that everybody's got their area to work in. Everybody's got their, their portion. Some of you in here, probably especially some of you ladies, are animal people. Meaning you love animals. And uh, you love dogs, you love cats, you love just animals, period. And there's probably, if you're an animal person, you probably just want to save every single animal that you see walking down the street. And, you know, there's a dog. Oh, my gosh. Mom, please pull over. Can we please pick it up? It might be lost. Let me post a picture on Ring. You know, let's, can, we, can we please pick it up? Look, it's so dirty or it's whatever. Oh, look, it's hobbling and it has three legs or whatever. And you just like, you just want to save every single dog and cat that you see. You see TV commercials. Not that everybody watches TV anymore, but you might see commercials. And then you're like, 
oh my gosh, you know, look at this, you know, these poor dogs, you know, and you just feel like you just want to go around the world. And I just want, Lord, could you just please call me to just save every dog in the world? And just, could you just, I'd really like to inherit the land of Australia so that I can kick out all the people and just fill it with stray dogs. Some of us are like that. Well, you cannot go around the world saving everything or everybody or fixing every problem that there is. It's important that you focus in on whatever God's calling you to do. So what you want to do is you want to say, Lord, the world is filled with problems. There are lots of things that I would love to do, Lord. But I pray that you would put me, direct me, toward the area that you want me to, to serve in and to, and to help and to assist and work. That's the valuable practical lesson here is that each of these tribes was getting a portion and they were expected to do what they were supposed to do. Now, there was a problem. Verse 13. Okay, so Joshua 13, 13. Okay, it says, Nevertheless, the children of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Makathites or the Geshurites and the Makathites dwell among the Israelites until this day. And so they were expected to go and clear out those people. But as we continue to go through Joshua, we will find out that not all of the tribes did that. Some of the tribes, they may have felt sorry. Like, ah, oh, I feel bad because these people lived here all of their lives and now I'm kicking them out. You know, maybe we can make a deal. You know, it's okay. Maybe you guys can stay. And so they allowed some of those people to stay there may seem nice on the surface, but it's like, it's like, it's like, like having your cousin come and stay the night at your house. And one night, man, that was so much fun. Two nights, that was, that was pretty fun. Three nights, it might be fun if you went back to your house. Four nights, this is not fun anymore. Five nights, I hate you, you know, or whatever. You know, it, it, it's like it, after a while, you know, you know, they overstay their welcome. Well, it's much more serious with these people because these are sinful people. And being allowed to stay in the land means that later on they might, no, they will cause trouble. And there will be then trouble from within. I mentioned this a study or two back. That if you and I do not root out sin, take it out by the roots. Some of you are specialists in weeds. Maybe you live on property, right? Oh, property. Property is great. You got lots of space to, you know, ride your motorcycle or whatever you do out there on your property and kill rattlesnakes, whatever. But it's filled with weeds. And your responsibility is to pull weeds. And you know that if you grab the weed and you just pull it and the top breaks off and the roots are still in there, you know that weed's coming back. Weeds are great. Like, you, try to grow vegetables. It's so hard. Weeds, not a problem. It doesn't even have to rain. They just grow. But if you, you know that it's best if you uproot it or spray it with poison so that it kills the roots. But when things are left, roots continue to grow and they end up causing us problems later. Great example, looking up stuff on the internet that we ought not be looking up. If we do not cut that out of our lives altogether, it will come back. Maybe it'll die down for a while. You know, ah, you know what? I think I'm over this. I think I'm great. It will, do, it, it, it will spring up again before you know it. So we've got to be careful with that. These people, the children of Israel, they were not consistent. They were not faithful to do what they were supposed to do. Not all of them. Some of them were. Some were not. And it will come back years later from, from this point that we're reading, and it will cause them problems again. Uh, we talked last time about um, uh, 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 Goliath, you know, and how his people were left in the land years prior. And then years later, he caused problems for the Israelites, uh, the Philistines. Now, we move to Joshua chapter 14. And what I've done is I've titled this passage. And again, we're not going to look at all of it. We will not look at the first five verses, as you can see there. But from verses 6 to 15, I titled Old Faithful. Old faithful. Old things are cool. How many of you like old things, old cars, old clothes, old music, uh, old TV shows? Uh, how many of you, this might sound like a weird question, how many of you like, you actually like old people? Anybody in here like old people? I happen to like old people, elderly people. 
I love to sit and listen to them, ask them questions, you know, and, you know, tell me about your life or whatever. Uh, that's very, very interesting to me. But I also like old cars and old clothes, obviously, and, you know, old, you know, vintage things and antique things. I love all of that stuff. Um, longevity, you know, that's, that's a rare thing, meaning something that lasts a long time. Most of the toys nowadays are made out of plastic. They break, you know, they're no good. Back in the old days, back in the old days, we had metal, you know, metal toys, and they just, they've lasted all of these years. Longevity is a cool thing. It can be a cool thing. Uh, Rylan was singing a song for us just minutes ago about us just singing to the Lord over and over how much we love him. But is that true of us? Could we really just consistently just sing to the Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, for just a long time, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years? Could we do that? It's hard for us. The videos that we watch, like I, when, when, I, when I'm scrolling through Instagram, looking at, looking at some, you know, some, some reels or some shorts, like, I'm, I, I'm, like what I want to do is I want to mindlessly scroll. And I'm watching this video waiting for this dude to get hurt. And if it takes too long for him to get hurt, dude, I ain't got time for this. I'll scroll through. Let's go. I'm like, okay, this one's funny. They immediately got hurt. Ha, 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 ha. You know, man, I feel so bad. Let's go on to the next one. You know, you know how we do. And we want things, we want it to be like immediate. You know, get home from school. I'm starving to death, right? To death. If I don't eat a Hot Pocket right now, I am literally going to die. You put your Hot Pocket in. How long does it take? It's like, seriously? It's like 2024. I got to wait 30 seconds for something to be warmed up. Like, let's go. I'm dying. And, and our attention span, everything is shortening. What about marriage? Much more serious. Marriages are ending. Some numbers say like half of marriages are ending in divorce. Some of you are intimately aware with it. You already know you've come from a broken, we got a name for it, broken family. So you're intimately aware with it and all the stuff that goes along with that. Longevity is, is it's a rare thing. Well, we have a man here who is a perfect example of longevity. This is a dude that lasted a long time, and we will look a little bit closer at his life. We're going to look at these verses, verses 6 to 11. You can already see there, for those of you that take notes, how this is broken down. Now, I will say this. The first five verses of this chapter are simply another list of lands being divided. So again, we're not, you know, we, we know what the idea is there. So we're focusing on this man named Caleb. We're going to see him remembering in verses 6 through 11 because that's one of the things that you do when you're old. You remember the good old days, right? If you've got a grandma and grandpa, they'll tell you, oh, in my day, and you're like, oh, gosh, here we go. But some of those stories are fantastic stories in my day. Remembering, we will see him requesting something. Okay, we'll get to that in a little bit. And then finally, the rewarding in verses 13 through 15. But where we start is in verses 6 through 11 and it says in verse 6 then the children of judah that's one of the tribes the tribe of judah the children of judah came to joshua in gilgal now joshua is busy dividing up the land giving land to the tribes he's in gilgal and the children of judah came to gilgal probably to get their land and caleb not the caleb in our high school group but Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, here's what he said to Joshua. He said, you know, now stop there for just a moment, you know. Well, how does he know that Joshua knows whatever he's going to share? Well, because him and Joshua have been friends for a really, really long time. In fact, maybe their entire lives. We will find out here in just a moment that they've been friends, they've known each other for at least 45 years, at least, but probably longer than that. He says, you know, the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me and Kadesh Barnea. Now, as he's remembering, whatever he's remembering is based on the word of the Lord. Okay, there it is in verses 6 and 7. Whatever he's remembering is based on the word of the Lord. It's a good thing to base, you know, your, your memory on. Remember what the Lord said. It's good to go back and remember the promises of God. What did God say? We got to count on that. We got to bank on that. Okay? If your dad says to you, hey, 
I need you to get those dishes done. Oh, but I wanted to go to the mall. Listen, you get those dishes done, I'll drop you off at the mall. I'll even, I'll give you a little bit of, you know, and he gives a little bit, huh? You're like, man, really? But he, you, you know, maybe, but, but what happens is you count on that. You get the dishes done and you're like, hey, dad, I'm ready to go. And oh, by the way, where's my little bit of, you know, where's my little bit of money? But you're counting on that. It's something that your dad told you. Same thing. He's remembering and it's based on what he heard from the Lord. Now, it goes on in verse 6 to say, you know, he's telling Joshua, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. Now, for those of you that do not understand, I'm going to give you the real short version. Joshua and Caleb, Joshua the leader, and here's Caleb. They were at a place called Kadesh Barnea, okay, 45 years ago. They were there. This guy's got a good memory. I can't remember what happened 45 minutes ago. 45 years ago. But he remembers what God said. He's reminding Joshua because Joshua was there. And he says, you remember what God said when we were at Kadesh Barnea. Now, when they were at Kadesh Barnea, God sent Joshua and Caleb and 10 other spies. Remember the 12 spies? He sent them in to spy out this new land. They came back after about a month. Joshua and Caleb said, Let's go. We can take them. Like, we, we got this. The Lord is with us. Let's go into the promised land, and let's just go have at it. The other 10 had the mall mentality, and they said, no way we can do that. I say mall mentality because, you know, we're, whatever everybody's doing, that's what everybody else wants to do. I was in Costco yesterday. Who goes to Costco on a Saturday afternoon? You know why? I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know that they had opened up all the mental hospitals and allowed everybody to go to Costco. Like, what? I don't understand. Why were all these people at Costco? It was crazy. It's insane. Anyways, I will never do that again in my life. Next time I go, it'll be, you know, super early in the morning or something. Anyways, mall mentality. Whoever, you know, everybody's there, so everybody's got to go. Everybody else has got to go. And the 10 spies said, no way. Joshua and Caleb said, no, 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 we can do this. Everybody listened to the 10 spies. They didn't go in. They didn't trust the Lord. And so they've been wandering around the wilderness for 40 plus years, 45 years. Now, here's what happens. In verse 7, Caleb, still talking, says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. So what I saw it was deep in here, what I felt, what I knew. I brought that back to the Lord. So he was faithful. He did his job well. But he was 40 years old then. He was, I was 40 years old back then. And that was the good old days, you know, when I was 40 years old. In verses 8 through 11, as he's remembering, it's based on the word of the Lord, but he also says, hey, I've wholly followed the Lord. I spelled that right, correctly, because what it means is uh, uh, um, uh, completely. He says, I've completely followed the Lord. Let's see this in verse 8. Nevertheless, my brothers who went up with me, see, he means his, his other countrymen, the other spies, made the heart of the people melt. He says, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So he remembers that. He says, 45 years ago, they turned, but I didn't. I was following the Lord. He doesn't stop there. Verse 9. So Moses swore on that day. He remembers what Moses swore. Here's what he said, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden, where it's walked, shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. So he says, I followed the Lord. And Moses confirmed, you followed the Lord. And what he said was that Moses gave him a promise. He said, Joshua and Caleb, we're leaving Kadesh Barnea. We're not going into the promised land. Sorry about that. However, I promise you that that land that you went and spied out, it will be yours. I guarantee you that. And the reason it's going to be yours is because you have completely or wholly followed the Lord. So what he did was he made him a promise. You are going to be rewarded. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Ah, verses 13 through 15, which we'll get to in a few minutes, okay? That's where we're going. 
He's making this request, and we haven't gotten to the request yet. We're going to get to it here in just a minute. But he wholly followed the Lord in verses 8 through 11, which we haven't finished reading. Verse 10. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. See, he credits God, keeping me alive all these years. As he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. Old. The guy is 85 years old. That's old. I'm not even 85 yet. Whether I'll make it or not, who knows. But that's that's pretty old. Some of you might have grandparents or maybe even great-grandparents. Some of you might have. But it's rare to come across somebody that's 80, 85 years old. Caleb is 85 years old. He credits God with keeping him alive that long. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I'm 85 years old. Verse 11. Look at this. As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me 45 years ago. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. I like this. This cup works really good if you open it. He says, I'm 85 years old. And he says, Joshua, I'm just as strong as I was 45 years ago. I like that. He doesn't stop there. Because what happens is he moves on into verse 12, which is our second main division. We go from remembering to requesting. And the word, the first two words in verse 12, now therefore. That means that Caleb is saying, when he says therefore, it means, so based on that, based on what? What he just told Joshua. He just told Joshua, I'm 85 years old, Joshua, but I feel just as strong as I did 45 years ago. And he says, because of that, verse 12, because of that, give me this mountain. Now, this is incredible. This is incredible. Joshua is dividing the land up. Remember that? Judah, the tribe of Judah shows up. And they're like, okay, we're here. What land do we get? And in the process of that, Caleb, this old guy, 85 years old, is like, Joshua, excuse me, Joshua's old friend. He's an old friend. Hey, Caleb, good to see you. He goes, listen, you know that I'm, I'm, I've, I've been old faithful. I've been following the Lord all these years. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I'm 85 years old. Yes, you are. Yes, Joshua was probably about the same age, old guy. He says, well, I've been following the Lord all these years. He goes, Joshua, I'm just as strong today, 85 years old, as I was when I was 40. And here's what he does next. This is crazy. He's, he's there to get his land. Let me tell you what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I'm 85 years old. Do you have a young guy that you can send to get my land for me? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, he doesn't say, you know what? Um, yeah, I want my land, but could you just make sure that it's really, really flat and green and grassy? Because, you know, I'm kind of old and my legs are swollen and my back hurts and, you know, I can't really. He says, I'm 85 years old. I'm just as strong today as I was when I was 40. I'm here for my land. I want the mountain. Let me ask you a question. How many of you like to hike, like to be outdoors and like to hike? few of you do okay so i'm assuming the rest of you do not like to hike how many of you do not like to hike okay a few of you maybe sometimes a little bit there are some of us in here that hate the thought of walking uphill and he says i'm 85 years old give me the mountain don't give me the easy land give me the mountain this is a wonderful lesson we talked about it last time you and i were together the willingness to do hard things, not to take the easy way out. Our society that we live in currently is focused on the easy way out. You no doubt have had somebody in your life say to you, you got to get a good education. Why? So that you don't have to work hard. You want a job you don't have to work hard at. It's just easy. And you want to make some easy money so that you can buy yourself a big RV. 
that's bigger than Pastor Chris's house so that you can go on some really nice expensive vacations to do what? Nothing. And then what you want to do is you want to save up enough money so that you can retire so that you have all the free time in the world for what? To do nothing. So what happens is our mindset, our goal, becomes this lifelong goal of just getting old enough to do nothing. Not in God's economy. In God's economy, nah, that's not good enough. That's not what life is about. Life is, is not about getting a, 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 a huge art. That's not the goal of it. It's okay if you want to get one, but the goal of, of, of the Christian's life is not to just get the biggest RV that you can with a trailer attached to that, with a boat attached to that, with another trailer with all your sand toys. That's not the goal. If you have that stuff, fantastic. Invite me. I'll come. But that's not the goal. The goal of life, of the Christian life, is not ease. And Caleb is a wonderful example. What we want to do is the older we get, the more we want to do, the harder we want to go, the harder jobs we want. We don't want to be looking for the easy way out. The easy way out, you know what that develops? Laziness. The easy way out, you know what that develops? A mentality that is okay with wasting time. Time's all we got, family. It's all we got. And it's going quick. You're going to use it for yourself, buy the biggest items that you can, or do you want to serve the Lord? Because you're going to be with him for eternity. And you can't drive to heaven. Remember that old song? You know, you, you, know, you can't get to heaven. Remember that? Anybody? Anybody remember that old song? You know, you can't get to heaven on roller skates. You can't get to heaven on, you know, whatever, you know, whatever object you want to put. You can't drive to heaven in an RV or in a boat or in sand toys or in anything else. You're just going there. It's just you. Sure, you want to try and take as many people with you as you can, but you're going to go and you're going to be there with them for eternity. You won't need that stuff. So it seems like maybe we should use our time to serve him. And Caleb has the right idea. He says, I'm 85 years old. Don't give me the flat land. Leave that for the sissy boys. Give me the mountain, he says. Give me the mountain. I'll take the mountain. And Joshua, what a wonderful friend. He says in verse 12, Now therefore give me the, this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. So Caleb, we see there from his request that he is fearless. He says that you, you know that the Anakim were there, the giants. But give it to me anyways, fearless. He goes on to say in the second half of verse 12, It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. It shows us that not only is he fearless, but he is filled with faith, or faith-filled. He says at the end of verse 12, It may be that the Lord will be with me. He knows the Lord's with him. He says, And I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. This is what we commonly refer to as a step of faith. I'm not really sure where the Lord's leading here, and you, this might come in handy for all of you wonderful young people. I'm not really sure where the Lord's leading here. I've submitted applications for this college or this job, and I'm not really sure. Sometimes you don't get a clear answer from the Lord where he just tells you, okay, you know, I want you to go to the left and turn right and go three spaces, go, you know, go three paces or whatever. So, so then sometimes you're looking at, you know, using the wisdom that he's given you. And you might have two good options. You go, man, I'm not really sure. Sometimes it's obvious. You go, well, if I go that way, I'll end up in prison. So that's probably not a good thing. Okay, let, you know, let me, I should go this way. But sometimes what you want to do is you want to commit it to prayer and say, Lord, I'm not really sure which way to go. This, this way looks more favorable to me, Lord. So I'm going to go that way. I'm going to take a step of faith this way. But God, if, you don't, if that's not the right way, that's okay. Then just close the doors up so I can't go that way. And then, and then I'll know to go a different direction. And maybe that's not the way. Maybe you close up the, that, that way too. Joshua seems to be doing, or rather Caleb seems to be doing that. He says, it may be that the Lord will be with me. So he's going to test it. I want that mountain. And it may be that God's going to be with me. And I'll be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. I think Caleb knew, hey, the Lord's going to be with me, although he makes it sound like, yeah, maybe the Lord's with me. 
The Lord's with him. He already acknowledged that he had kept him alive for 85 years. So he's counting on God. That's based on what? The word of the Lord that he got. Remember? Kadesh Barnea. Now, we finish up in the last section, verses 13 through 15, which is the rewarding. So it says in verse 13, And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron, that mountain, to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. I've got a good friend named Augie. Some of you know Augie. Anybody in here know Augie? He's been at some of our camps and stuff. He hasn't been around for a little while, but Augie's a good friend. One of the things that makes him a good friend is that he encourages me to do crazy things. Some people might call them stupid things, but crazy things. And for years, we served in youth ministry together. And I would come up with these ideas, like, Augie, oh, I, uh, I think what we're going to do this year for summer camp is uh, we're going to drive up to Big Sur up north, and we're going to camp with like 30 of us. And he would be like, all right, let's, or he would say, all right, dog, let's go. And he would be like, I'm down, dog, let's go. And he would take a week of vacation off from his own job. And he would just go with us, do some crazy stuff. And he'd be like, I'll cook or I'll, you know, yeah, I'll drive or I'll whatever. This man pulled this huge trailer up the one. I don't, you probably, you may, maybe you never drove the one. But, but when you get way up north, the one is like, rrr, 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 and he just drove the trailer, man. He's like, rrr, driving that thing up the, all, all the way up the one. He was just like down for whatever. Joshua He's friends with Caleb. He doesn't go, Caleb, you're 85 years. Dude, we're old. Simmer down. I'll give you the flat land. He goes, nah, take the mountain. Go ahead, go for it. You want some friends like that, that'll encourage you to step out in faith, do some crazy things for the Lord. You want to be a friend like that for other people, other Christians. You want to say, hey, no, you know what? We just, let's, we just need to move forward like by faith. Like, let's go. Let me pray for you. You might have a friend that's like, uh, you know what, I, I, I don't know, it sounds kind of crazy, but I'm thinking about trying out for the soccer team at school. I don't know if I'm that good or not. And then you just, you tell them, not nah, like, you know, <clears throat> I don't know, but let's pray. And then just go try it. And let's see what the Lord does. You want to encourage your friends that way. And you want friends to encourage you that way. Joshua and Caleb were like that. It was a good thing. It was a, it was a good, good relationship. But in verse 13... He's rewarding him with Hebron, Hebron, the land of Hinar, or Hebron, or that mountain there. He says, all right, all right, Caleb, it's yours. And then in verses 14 and 15, we've seen this phrase again before. We see it one more time before we finish. It says in verse 14, Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite to this day. Why? Because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. He was rewarded for consistently following the Lord completely, consistently. He was rewarded for that. What did he get? He got the land that he wanted. I want this land. All right, you got it. It's yours. Based on the promises of God. Finally, in verse 15, the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. This is neat. Arba was the greatest man among the, the Anakim. In other words, it ain't called Kirjath uh, uh, Arba anymore. Now it's called Hebron. How, what happened, Caleb? What changed, Caleb? A man of faith came in. That old man, he's 85 years old. Yeah, I know. But he's mean, tough. And he came in and cleared it out. And it says at the end of verse 15, then, then the land had rest from war. Keep in mind, the battles aren't over yet. It's talking about portions of the land. It wasn't big battles going on. Now it was smaller battles. But as we finish, I want you to think about this. Think about this. Caleb makes this request based on a promise that he got 45 years ago. 45 years ago. And for 45 years, he's been waiting for God to fulfill that promise. 45 years. Can you imagine yourself doing anything for 45 years? Some of you 
The only thing you can imagine is like, oh yeah, I can see myself gaining for 45 years. Some of you will. <laughs> 45 years. 45 years he waited. And Caleb was faithful. What has he been doing? We haven't heard much about Caleb. We heard about him back in Exodus. We didn't hear much about him. Now all of a sudden he shows up again. What's he been doing? I don't know exactly what he's been doing on the daily. Like, what are his tasks? What was his job? What was he doing? That I don't know. What I do know is that for 45 years, he's kept his eyes locked on the Lord. He's just been waiting for God to fulfill his promise. That's it. What a wonderful lesson for you and I. That it doesn't matter how long it takes, God is faithful. He will keep his promise. It doesn't matter how long it takes. My only job, you've heard it, you know, you had one job. My one job is to follow the Lord. What does that mean? It means you just live your life pleasing to the Lord. You let him do whatever he wants in his time. 45 years later, he's been waiting for this promise to be fulfilled for 45 years. And wouldn't you know it, Caleb is old faithful, sure he is, but God is even more old faithful. And he fulfilled his promise to Caleb because Caleb had kept his eyes on the Lord. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful thought. What a wonderful lesson. That what I need to do is I just need to focus on the Lord. Doesn't matter how long it takes. Let, let God do whatever God's going to do. Let him, let him work in me and through me for whatever he wants to do. I want to think longevity. Like, again, I'm not planning every point of my future out, but I just know, Lord, for however long I'm on this earth, I want to follow you. I don't know if it's two more years, 20 more years. I don't know what it is, God, but whatever it is, I want to follow you. And whatever you want to do, you do it. Whatever promises you want to fulfill, go for it. But I just want to make sure that as the older I get, the harder I'm just like, I'm, I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm in this, man. Like, no, there's no, there's no going back. Like, I put my hand to the plow. There's no turning back. I'm just going to follow the Lord. That's what Caleb did. And he was rewarded for that faithfulness. What a wonderful thought, wonderful lesson. Father, thank you so much for this uh, word.